Welcome to another news. I'm Jeff Brady. We talk today with returning guest Dr. Carmen Bolter. She's the director, producer, and writer of the powerful documentary series called The Pyramid Code. The series has aired in more than 30 countries, and there are many breakthrough discoveries in it, such as how the Great Pyramid of Egypt served as an energy generator. But we talk with Dr. Bolter about the recent discovery of a massive ancient underground site below the Hawara Pyramid in the Fayum Oasis region south of Cairo, Egypt. It's about 30 miles from the Nile River. The area is rich in history, as you would imagine, and the layers above it are known to be Roman. The second layers are Ptolemaic. Further below 60 feet and then down to 130 feet, the mysteries begin. The site has been measured to be 107 acres. We also discuss how this site was rediscovered using space archaeology. A software program was applied to enhance the visual output of a satellite camera. It reads element signatures and depth. This technology will basically see through many feet underground revealing man-made structures. How old can this site be? It's not known at this point, but Dr. Bolter references the calendar of catastrophes and recalls the historic prophecy, quote, when the head of the crab hits the head of the lion. This implies a processional cycle. Ancient texts reveal that Atlantis had three major catastrophes. One, 13,600 years ago. Another, 17,500 years B.C. And the first one, the date, is unknown. Some of these geological time frames are depicted on the ceiling of the Temple of Dendera. Dr. Carmen Bolter joins us to talk more about this site. Welcome back to the show. Hey, nice to be back. Earlier this year, you were on as a guest recapping some of the discussions we've had about the Pyramid Code, your documentary series, and the Great Pyramid serving as an energy generator and revealing new information about a very special site discovered deep underground located near the Hawara Pyramid. And you've recently returned from Egypt with a focus on this discovery. Can you remind listeners about what this is and what's been discovered? Well, what we have now is a term called space archaeology, and there's new technology that, of course, is more powerful than what we had in the past. And so there have been surveys done of this um, site uh, using ground-penetrating radar laying um, wires right on the site. But now we have much, much more powerful tools that allow us to look six kilometers into the, below the surface of the Earth. But the real strength of this technology is that it looks through layers. And so in the other GPR, if you hit something and you see an anomaly, then that's it. You don't get to look below it. And so uh, I've managed to get, uh, using the uh, satellite um, coordinates, mm -hmm. I managed to get an HD satellite-based scan done through GeoScans and Klaus Donna. And uh, there's the discovery is actually two distinct levels that don't cross between them. There's no staircases going up and down. And there's a total of 82 chambers and a, a kilometer and a half of passageways. And it's absolutely enormous. It's, it's 81 football fields um, in the, the general area. Mm -hmm. And um, six of the chambers are the size of Olympic-sized swimming pools. And many of them are bigger than the average-sized house. So we're, it's almost like, you know, burying an airport kind of thing, like why would they need such big passageways and why w would it be so deep? So the discovery is uh, on two distinct levels, mm -hmm. very deep in the earth. From the construction, looking at the shapes of the uh, chambers and that sort of thing, and because one is so much deeper than the other, it looks to me, archaeologically speaking, that older is deeper, that it could be put there by in two completely different time frames. Okay, I'm looking at the map. I'm so happy to have this available, and I appreciate you putting these out uh, into the public domain. The blue level is the layer closest to us, and that's a little more than 60 feet deep. Then below that is uh, the red layer, which is another 60 feet or more below. And you're right, uh, there doesn't seem to be anything connecting uh, the two layers. In terms of uh, your 
archaeological experience, is there a time frame between those two layers? Older is deeper, and, in, uh, and that's really deep, and so I'm suggesting it's really old. The other thing is that there is a, a ruler in Google Earth, and the distance from the top of the pyramid to the Nile, the present Nile, is 30 kilometers. And so in the pyramid code, this you know it's shown that the Sphinx is actually eight miles from the Nile. And so there's been a lot done on redating the Sphinx, you know, up to, what, 36,000, you know, years ago, could be even older. And this has got to be really, 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 really old, outside of the mm. natural um, way that we think of time, mm. especially since the Bible and the Quran and all that in school wants us to think we're 6,000 years old. And there were two other layers on top, the Ptolemaic layer and then the Roman layer on top of that that were excavated in 1881 by Sir William Flinders Petrie. And so that material is already out of the ground and in the Petrie Museum. And they found, you know, Roman sarcophagi with painted faces on the outside so that the uh, the person who was deceased actually would have their face painted onto their wooden sarcophagus, which is relatively recent. And then the Ptolemaic layer is Anthony Cleopatra's time, and then it goes older and older, down to the blue level, older, older, down to the red level. So it's we need to go and verify these scans are very accurate in terms of other things that have been located and then gone and um, excavated and found. And so uh, there's a lot of success and reliability with this particular technology. It's actually, they're, they're, they're referring to it as spooky accurate. It's so accurate it's disconcerting. Right, the uh, space archaeology, the particular satellite, uh, its resolution and ability to pass through uh, solid objects now underground. And looking at the the map, there are some similarities with the the red and blue layer, layer uh, in terms of the hallways. Uh, but the blue layer looks a little bit more advanced in terms of its structure and layout. The red layer seems to be hallways or long hallways, and occasionally there'd be a block here, a block there. But the blue layer seems to be much more modified structurally. Well, and that's what kind of gives the clue that they wouldn't have been put there at the same time. So it would be a different group that would have constructed it in a completely different time frame. That's what it seems to be. Now... Um, the size of the chambers seems to be relevant, and if you look at those charts on that link, each of the chambers is, is a decreasing size, yet they're still, even the, the bottom, um, the, the, the smallest one is still bigger than the average size house on those two levels. And so um, there seems to be a sequence, um, it almost looks like notes on a scale. So there's 31 layers, sorry, 31 chambers on one level and 32 on the other. So there's something to the shapes and the sizes that seems to be relevant. So relevant to what? Now, on the blue level, the, the bulk of the big chambers, you can see if you look at the map, that it's, um, if you look at Google Earth, that they're, they're almost the size of the, the farmer's fields next to it on the oasis. And so why would they need to be so big? Why are these chambers self-contained without having like a doorway between them to connect them? So it doesn't look to me like it's a temple of any description because you go through the front the front into the first hypostyle hall and then the next chamber leads to the next to the next all the way down to the Holy of Holies at the back of any traditional temple in Egypt nowadays. So it speaks to a completely different reason for having things down there. There are some freestanding rooms. What do you think those are? Well, my thought is that it's a repository of some description that um, we know from ancient texts that Atlant Atlantis uh, had three major catastrophes, one 13,660 years ago, one 17,500 B.C., and the first one, I don't have a date on it. The ancient texts are um, describing these calamities that happened, and it seems that uh, in those long periods of time, it could have been the Golden Age and the Dark Age going round and round the processional cycle over a long, long period of time. And it seems that they knew that another disaster was coming. And if you imagine, you know, our grid going down, uh, we're sitting at our computers, talking on the phone, 
Uh, but if the whole electricity grid goes down, then, you know, we don't stay in our homes. We go walk around, especially in the winter, go find somewhere we can light a fire. Um, it's not that we're stupid. It's that the grid went down. You know, the technology no longer works. And so if it was predicted that this was going to happen, it stands to reason that there would be evacuation committees of some description. What are we going to do with our stuff? What are we? How are we going to protect people? Almost like a time capsule of some description. Like, how can we preserve some of what we know, some of the knowledge, some of the technology, and go put it somewhere? Now, the other thing is that the precious metals can be detected through this scan, as well as the distinction between pottery, precious jewels, water, uh, and space. So, and bone. And so there are six chambers on both levels that actually are, it's, the scan is indicating that there's gold. So what do you make of that? Gold. How much gold? What form? Well, that we don't know. It's just that these particular cavities, there's a few that have gold and bone, and some just have gold. Now, that could be gilded on the wall with some kind of message. That could be artifacts. And so, you know, the, the first survey of the site could be drilling boreholes down into these precise areas and having a camera that can do 3D mapping and go look before an excavation would be done. I wanted to ask you, Carmen, looking at the layout of these uh, two layers, is there any correspondence that people are talking about with constellations? No, because I don't think that it was ever meant to be viewed from the ground level. So there's a lot of sky-ground correlations with the pyramids and the Band of Peace, north and south of the Giza Plateau. We could do archaeoastronomy survey, and there could be some connections. But, you know, I think it's too deep to expect that, like, think about the Sphinx has been buried to its neck and then excavated a few times. But this is so much deeper than that. It's hard to imagine that the sand would have just filled in and that it would have been on the surface trying to mimic something above. Um, and so the red layer actually has passageways that follow the existing canal, which was put there later, later in time by the guy who built the Suez Canal, Louis de Belfon. And so, yep, there's a lot more questions. But I think a really good question is better than a poor answer, right? So um, we've got some good questions, <laughs> not a lot of answers. Yes. So are these chambers uh, filled with sand and debris, or are they open? Uh, It seems that they're open, and Herodotus talked about it in 450 BC, talking about going on the blue level, but uh, not going below, but hearing stories about it. And so the the, the old literature talks about 1,500 rooms on each level, and um, I'm not sure if that's exactly precise. Uh, And Over the years, Pliny, Strombo, these 600 years apart, so these people weren't talking to each other about what was seen there, but it was known, and so it would make sense that, you know, another group would go back to the same site, which is why there are four levels, four distinct levels of time as well represented at this one place. I I wanted to ask you about that, the various references uh, throughout other civilizations and even in our history back into uh, the 1800s. This is a rediscovery, in, in a sense. It's a new discovery on one level, but what prompted this scan to begin with? Well, I think that there's enough legend that people have been really curious, even if it was just the Roman level, you know, and, and so there's been a limited amount of excavation done in Egypt over the past 30 years, And, you know, longer than that, it seems that there hasn't been a lot of, um, you know, honest-to-God discoveries done. You know, King Tut, that was pretty good, found a lot of really beautiful um, artifacts there. But I think that people have known about it, they've discussed it, there's things that were found there, and there's still more to be found. And yet, you know, the, the word on the street has been that there's nothing there. And so now we have access to strong technology where you don't even have to be in Egypt to get the scan, which is the hypothesis. That's not the verification. But it seem, it stands to reason um, that there is something there. Now, the last round of science that was done was done in 2008 on-site by laying wires on the sand and sending weak 
electric signals down and through, but that was measuring the 5 meter to 12 meter level. And so there still seems to be anomalies at that level, but that, that is not what we're talking about here. So I think that the that the storyline and the legends and people in the area would have been talking just about the the stories that have you know endured over millennia. Are there um, stories back in ancient dynasties, say for example the Ptolemaic era, where they reference this site? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The other thing is that there's a mud brick pyramid over the top and. That, you know, the, the, the construction of using mud bricks for pyramids is recent. And so what we see throughout Egypt is the strongest, uh, the best construction is the oldest. And then the more, quote unquote, modern is, is, is weaker. And so they call it the weeping pyramid because of the way the water, when it would rain, the rivulets would get established because it's actually mud. So it would kind of go soft. Not that there's been much rain in that area for a long time, but it is right beside an oasis. And it speaks to a lot of water in the region. And so the modern pyramid is actually uh, deteriorating, and you can see through some of the bricks, right, because they've eroded um, with the moisture. And so that probably, you know, got added relatively recently. There's lots of unknowns, because there could be a straight-sided pyramid underneath it. I guess my question would be, what are other civilizations saying in reference to this uh, particular site? Is there anything that can add more evidence and start to fill in the picture a little bit more without excavation? Well, they're saying that the ceiling were made out of a single slab of stone, and I don't even know how that's possible. Um, And the thing is, though, is that even in the Pyramid Code, Herodotus, you know, met a boy in the village that told him, you know, that the pyramids were tombs and, you know, told stories about what was going on. And he went back and repeated it. And we've been telling that story since, whether it's true or not. So I think that it's it's important to to look at what everyone's said about it, but not just take it at face value, because a lot of things are contradictory. But to me, the idea of like a storage area for technological uh, equipment, perhaps, you know, chambers for reorientation, something. I mean, we've had exposure to an awful lot of ancient uh, artifacts that, you know, are speaking to a worldwide culture that uh, had a sophisticated technology that has just kind of been driven into obscurity. So people like Michael Cremo, you know, has been doing forbidden archaeology. I happen to be speaking with him August 29th and 30th in Vancouver and Victoria on the Modern Knowledge Tour. Hmm. And so... He has made a point of finding things that don't fit, like in finding you know, dating techniques, potassium argon, various techniques that go way beyond what carbon-14 will do that can measure extreme antiquity of bones. And he's got artifact, or he's got um, skeletons that are like a million years old. Okay, so how does that fit? And then we've got Klaus Donna, who has been specializing in out-of-place artifacts that, again, speak to extreme antiquity, and he's been using thermoluminescent and photoluminescent dating techniques and, and, and has uh, you know, accumulated photographs. He leaves the artifacts in situ where, where they're found, but photographs them and then sees that all the way around the world there's this unified writing, and, and all of that speaks to extreme antiquity. So whereas uh, Michael Cremo focuses mostly on, on, on skeletons and bones, uh, Klaus Donna is focusing, you know, not that they don't cross over, but mostly on artifacts. And so we're, we're realizing that there's more and more of this, that there could have been a worldwide culture that had a completely different society than we could even have conceived of. So slowly all these pieces are coming together. And we still, like I say, have a lot of questions. But, um, you know, that all the stories of Sitchin and 450,000 years ago and it came from off planet and you know a lot of people just repeat what Sitchin said and I mean how do you line up evidence of that uh, Sumerian tablets you know there's always the errors in translation but you know how did we start all this like you've been doing a lot of research on on UFOs and all that well if if, if somebody came from off planet What did they bring with them, and where did they put their stuff, and how did they orient from coming from another, another energy density, if you will, you know? 
Is there any evidence? The continuous rock ceiling, Carmen, is really interesting to me because it reminds me of the uh, giant slabs of rock that are in these ancient sites that are impossible to move. There, There was no equipment that could have moved them. Is that the case here with this giant slab of rock ceiling? Well, again, without going and looking and seeing Mm -hmm. if it is one giant piece, that's what's being said about it. Mm -hmm. Well, and the other thing, too, is like when you think of things like Baalbek and that absolutely enormous, enormous rock. But now we've got Joseph Davidovich talking about geopolymers, like possibly this stone was poured like cement. and, And then hardened to the point where you can't tell the difference between the poured stone that's granite and the, and the carved stone that's granite. And so, um, and even if you think about places like Machu Picchu, well, it's at 14,000 feet. Yes. So, you know, even if you, you know, we're, we're getting the rock from elsewhere, how do you get it all the way up the mountain? I was laughing because I was thinking of Coral Castle and that individual pouring those casts, but I don't think so. I think that's another story there. But that's a very interesting uh, possibility, and it makes more sense to me that it was poured because how do you how do you move something like that? Um, so there was a ceiling, but this means that it was underground, correct? It was, as you pointed out, it wasn't meant to be above ground. Yeah, I don't think it ever was meant to be above ground. And there's plenty of uh, you know underground cities on the planet. Uh, we're told that the entirety of Crete uh, has been surveyed with this particular technology and that it's a honeycomb of of rooms underneath the ground. They talk about a labyrinth and the Minotaur and the Minoan culture. And this site is known as the Labyrinth of Egypt. Um, And so apparently there's um, stories of whoever built the labyrinth in Crete would have visited this site. And uh, Gavin Menzies talks about the Minoans, they talked about King Minos. I'm not sure if that was actually the, 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 the right name, but that's the name that they're going by. But that the Minoans could easily have been descendants of the Atlanteans. Okay, well then what do we have? And they were, you know, in harmony with nature, and they had beautiful art, and they uh, did acrobats with the animals, so they had the bulls. And you see images uh, in the Temple of uh, Knossos on Crete of, you know, a man doing a handstand on the back of the bull as the bull is, you know, charging across wherever they were doing their their shows, you know, and so they're actually doing tumbling and gymnastics with the animals. Well, that is a completely different culture than anything we've seen before, and it seems to have ties to the distant past when Atlantis would have um, been flourishing. Well, in terms of uh, beginning to excavate this area, what is needed? I, I mean, I understand you have to get permits to begin an excavation from the Supreme Council of Antiquities. It's a lot of work to go through to get there. Can you describe that process? Well, there is a, a new minister, as there is a new elite uh, in Egypt. Zahi Hawass has stepped down, even though he's still, you know, interested and still curious about certain things, but um, there are 12 pages of guidelines that go with an application. So it's a very serious application. They're looking for archaeologists from reputable universities. They're not renewing any permits. They say right on the beginning that um, no new permits to excavate will be granted in Upper Egypt and brackets from Giza to uh, Abu Simbel, which is practically everywhere that there are sites. And so there's been a real restriction, and apparently this site is exempt, but they either want only Egyptian teams, the foreign missions have to be somebody who doesn't reapply. So it's this big dance, and so we need a certain amount of support to, um, you know, know how to present this application. And, I mean, it's, uh, you know, because they haven't been giving a lot of, you know, applications, it's kind of like Mission Impossible, And yet there seems to be quite a lot of interest in finding out what's really down there. But, you know, even the archaeological technology to get to do it, to do the dig, is also something that is an enormous responsibility for the principal and the secondary archaeologists. So um, I'm working to get these permits. I'm working with uh, people in Egypt who I've been in touch with in the last uh, day, actually, on, on how to best go about this in a way that the permits will be accepted. 
they do say there's a new minister that's going to be put in place, uh, that the other minister has been highly restrictive so that new digs won't happen. Uh, so it's all a little bit iffy. It's a little bit, you know, it's a, it, it, and we're going to continue to try because there is um, a lot of interest in it. And so put our best foot forward. But just the way, you know, you don't call up a university and say, hey, I want to do a PhD, okay? You know, uh, do you have a master's? Do you have a bachelor's? Uh, here's the application process. What do you intend to research? And then it goes to a committee. And, you know, it's a big official process. And the committee meets you know, every eight weeks. And you submit a formal application and hope that, um, that they'll accept it. And you don't do anything without that. Gotcha. I wondered if there were obstacles to that. So say you get uh, the permit and you are starting to uh, excavate. How long would something like this take? Well, it all depends. I mean, some people have said, you know, just get a bulldozer over the top and then get 100 guys with those leather buckets that you've seen in documentaries. Well, if you did it that way, it may take, you know, 10 years. And how many changing of the guards would you see in that time? Um, there's other places that have, like the Queen of Sheba dig in Yemen, Sabah, Yemen. I was a candidate for the expedition to go there. And they actually just get sand removal equipment and vacuum the place. And so you'll see that sand dunes, you know, grow over a road in Egypt, and then they just get this equipment and, and, and clear the road. Uh, in Dubai, they built all those islands by putting a barge with one of these pieces of equipment, digging down underneath the ocean and getting the sand, putting it on the barge, and then repositioning it to make these islands. So this equipment exists. I think if these structures stand alone, um, the first step would be to do a site survey, and there is a more precise piece of equipment that goes with the scan, that the team who does the scan would come on location and, and, and say, here, dig a borehole right here. And so it would be a question of doing a few boreholes, sending... Um, a camera with an LED light on it to do uh, 3D mapping of the room by photographing the whole place to get an idea of what's down there. And then um, it would be up to the archaeological team that would be responsible for how the dig is done. But usually it's eight-week eight units is a season. And so how many years do you go back? But with the Queen of Sheba dig, they would they would vacuum, as I say, the, 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 the temple take pictures, you know, go with a little brush and clear out his own and take pictures, and that would be eight weeks, and then they'd come back ten months later and have to uh, get the sand out of the temple again, so they'd go to another section. And over the several field seasons, they ended up with a pretty good um, mapping of what's down there, but it doesn't stay excavated, so I think that it would have to be a continuous excavation to get that deep, and you'd have to just keep going until you got to the depth where you could actually enter some of these chambers. But one of the things as they've continued with the, it's a live satellite feed, and everywhere they look, they've been finding more. And so what we haven't found is the entrance. And this is the technology that was used to find the, the entrance to the tunnel system at the Bosnian pyramids, where they've been excavating now for eight or nine years. You know, so it, it, it would I would think that it would have to be a continuous thing or else it would just, like I say, fill back in, and then you'd have to start over if you left. So there's a lot of questions, and we'll 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 see, you know, if there's if there's the goodwill to go do it or not. Hearing you speak about this, it does make sense to locate the entrance to see if you could dig one hole toward the entrance and walk right in. That makes sense on some level, but what do you think the potential? significances in terms of resetting archaeological history. Okay, if we were to find an artifact or a piece of an artifact of an artifact that's datable, um, then uh, we take that to a special lab which would no doubt be outside of Egypt and 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 get a date. So let's say uh, now we're not finding pottery. The scan does not show that there's pottery down there, which is interesting. But there are tests that can show the last time something was heated. And so, you know, in order to glaze pottery, it has to go into the the, the big ovens, and, and so you could date it. So what could we find if there was anything at all that we could find that we could date? Then then we, we start to have something that's concrete. My best guess is that it's older than 100,000 years old. And so if that's the case, then we really are rewriting history. 
And that may be threatening to, you know, the, the system that wants to keep everything the same and keep every, everybody believing that we're 5,000, 6,000 years old. And who does that benefit? So this is rewriting history. This would be that. And it may be too threatening. Um, that doesn't mean we can't speculate because we still have the scan. So we, it's there. There's something down there. And it's, it's not at any depth that anybody thought before. So we've got something. And there's, you know, there's an awful lot of archaeological sites that have had this te- scanning technology applied to it. That doesn't mean the governments around the world are going to let it actually happen. But, I mean, we, we could write, rewrite history based on many, many things that have been found recently. And uh, what some governments are doing is actually allowing the excavations. So three new pyramids in Ecuador, uh, you know, lots of different things being found in various places with excavations going with it. And so, um, you know, if, we, if this doesn't happen, there's other places. There seems to be um, more and more that's unifying. Uh, there's pyramids popping up all over the world. Uh, they were obviously sitting there before, but uh, if they are pre-Diluvian, then um, the silt from the the backing off of the water would be deposited on top of the pyramid and things grow. And so with the Bosnian pyramids, it, it doesn't look like a straight-sided pyramid initially because the trees are all different heights. But if as they've done the excavation, they see that it very definitely is a straight-sided pyramid with trees over the top. And so there's more and more of those kinds of pyramids being found. And so I think we have to rewrite our idea of, of what really went on on this planet a long time ago. Our guest is Dr. Carmen Bolter. We're speaking about the recent discovery of a massive ancient underground site in Egypt. We'll be right back after this break. If you've just tuned in, we're speaking with returning guest Dr. Carmen Bolter about a recent discovery of an ancient underground site below a pyramid in Egypt. On a semi-related uh, topic here, there was a, a video uh, that I was pointed to uh, with uh, Graham Hancock and Zahi Was scheduled to speak at an event and have a discussion on uh, this area. And it seemed to uh, disintegrate pretty quickly. And I wondered uh, what was going on there, if you can tell listeners, because I'd like to play a, just a section of that audio from that video, but just because so they get an idea of how intense this is. <laughs> well, um, there was a team member from the 2008 uh, work that was done there that was invited, and Zahi and Graham Hancock were apparently going to meet at the site, uh, and then there was going to be a debate on April 24th at Mena House uh, in a conference room with people from Graham Hancock's tour. So you can see that, that Zahi actually looked like he was going to be part of this trip and go down there. Now, all along, Zahi has said there's nothing down there. He's claimed there's nothing underneath the Giza Plateau, which we know there is. I think he had never been to the site. And so uh, the debate was scheduled. Um, It was just going to be between Graham and Zahi. Zahi insisted on speaking last. Uh, Graham put his slides up and started his presentation. Mm -hmm. And the first slide he had was of the Giza Plateau and the connection to Orion, which is a sky ground correlation. That is Robert Boval's Orion theory. Mm -hmm. 
and in the New Age community, that's pretty much accepted. That and and I've done work on um, the the pyramid sites north and south and their correlations as well using Starry Night and and it seems to be conclusive. But Zahi Hawass uh, doesn't agree with that, and so he 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 wants to maintain the idea that the pyramids were tombs and Cheops was in the Great Pyramid and that if he keeps digging inside or in in his day, that if he kept looking inside the Great Pyramid, he was going to find the mummy of Cheops, and this is a direct uh, confrontation to him. And there's been a situation with some paint being scaled off of the relieving chambers above the Davidson chambers uh, inside the Great Pyramid, uh, and that three foreigners were there and that they took some of the paint and then they ended up in jail. And Robert Bavall has been very vocal about the unfairness of this and what can we do to get those people out of, out of jail in Egypt. And so this has ruffled the feathers of Zahi. So when Zahi saw Robert Boval's the slide that represented his theory, he just said, forget it. No, I'm not doing this. And then Graham Hancock says, well, in academia, we debate the issues, not the people. And apparently Zahi stormed out of the room, and it was caught on video, and it went viral. And this debate was supposed to be about this site. Okay, uh, let's have a listen to part of that audio. This man is a thief and a good old doctor. And a good old doctor is not a good old doctor. He 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 is not a good it's closed in Chicago by all the Bremer by everyone. Exactly, and we won't get it. It's connected. No, please, don't say this to me. Don't say this word to me. It's a shame on you, not on me. So have a couple of discussions, Dr. Murray. Don't talk to me. Please, go away from me. Shame on you. Why do you say shame on me? Why? I told you so. This man did bad things. I don't know who he is dead. This man. And I am going to be called. I, I want to read this man not even that this can be happening. Because he's a cop. It's not my own business. We should be able to have Please, I don't want to talk to you. Please. Okay, yes, that is a very heated uh, exchange. And it makes me think about this individual, Zahi. Why is he so attached to uh, a particular, you know, way of thinking about this when it's constantly changing? What's the agenda? Who funds his work? Why is he so, so attached to it? Well, apparently he was on payroll with National Geographic, getting some $200,000 a year to then be the star archaeologist that was on every single documentary, and he could, you know, claim that any discovery that was made in Egypt was actually his. And that seemed to be the game. And so when he found out that there were people actually doing some um, testing on the site, not excavating, but testing, um, you know, he just, you know, had somebody go down there and threw them out of, threw them out of the country with a death threat and put the e Egyptologist in jail and... Uh, and basically shouted off rooftops to say, there's nothing there, there's nothing there, there's nothing there. However, uh, an announcement about that, uh, that they'd found anomalies, did come out in 2008, and it was published in the newspapers um, in Austria and Germany, and, that, and then Reuters actually called to verify, is this announcement correct? And Zahi said, take it off, take it down, take the website down, there's nothing there, there's nothing there, there's nothing there. So it seems to keep the old story going. Uh, you have to shut down everybody who's got a different opinion. And so it seems to be a threat to the status quo that, you know, we're 5,000 years old and there's nothing down there. These are interference patterns. I mean, humanity, what's, what's the truth? How can we get at the truth? I, I, I see that they, they want to keep the old story going. Right. When there's a lot more evidence coming forward, uh, to evolve the discussion. And this gentleman seems to want to protect his claim on certain uh, aspects of history. So 
maybe a lot of what he's discovered will still be intact, but maybe some of it won't. And you got to learn to live with it. Well, and then there's stories like artifacts that were found in Peru, for example, that went to a dating lab, a photoluminescent dating lab. The guess, the hypothesis, was that this could be like 100,000 years old. And the, the, the lab kept this artifact for over a year and then came back and said it was 4,800 and some years old. Well, that's because no artifact in Peru has ever been allowed to be older than 5,000 years old. And when they gave the artifact back, um, they said, oh, you don't have to pay. And so even the labs are corrupt. So to find, you know, labs that can actually do the dating and tell the truth about the date is challenging. And that if something is out of place, if something is older and it doesn't fit fit with the story, they bury it again. Yes. Uh... Or they take it in, in a boat and dump it in the in the river. So what is actually happening is evidence is being tampered with. Yes, a parallel to this lab test result story is uh, a woman I interviewed in Arizona who got some cobweb material that she suspected came out of a, a military aircraft, and she had it tested at a, a lab that said it was uh, cow bandages or cattle bandages. We have to find independent labs to, to do testing at, obviously. But I want to go into uh, some of the realm of speculation that you do about about who built these structures underground at this site and uh, the Atlantean connection, because I don't really know that much about it. And I wonder what information that you have that supports some of the speculation with Atlantis. Okay. I've seen this prophecy several times in different contexts, but apparently they had, the, the prophecy reads, when the head of the crab hits the heart of the lion, and they're actually speaking about the constellations, the crab being Cancer and the lion being Leo, that somehow these two astronomical, astrological um, realms would crash into each other, which hardly makes sense. But the, the prophecy says that when that happened, there would be a disaster. And that, you know, and so it sounds like that something like an asteroid hitting, that there was a, a way that they could predict that. And what we see in Egypt on the first hyperstyle hall of the newly cleaned ceiling of the Temple of Dendera and the round zodiac, the, the one that's known as the zodiac of Dendera that Napoleon copied and then left the replica in Egypt in situ and put the real one, took it and ended up in the Louvre. And so they've renamed that now to the calendar of catastrophes. And it shows, it pinpoints, there's a woman named Svetlana Pavlova, it pinpoints the exact moment when this disaster would have hit, but it also apparently knocked the axis of the Earth off by 14 degrees, which is what is mapped on the Giza Plateau, the angle and measuring when the solstices and equinox would come up based on these causeways. And it's they had to recalculate, and so the ceiling of the Temple of Dendera has a linear zodiac. It's basically saying the flood happened right here, and this is what we had before, and this is what happened after. And so there's places like Napta Playa and Gilf Kabir in Egypt where they started, like like I said before, with the metaphor that the you know the grid goes down. Uh, so there's some people that survive. Uh, Gilf Kabir means high plateau. The cave of the swimmers, as as noted in uh, the English patient, is there. Some people would have swam along. They didn't drown. They climb up on this high plateau and start again with Sirius, Orion the Pleiades, you know, the the pole star, and mapping out just our place in the universe, our place in the solar system, which was really important to the ancients. And so it seems, you know, that it points to all of this, and the rest of the ceiling, I mean, this is 40 feet high, mm -hmm. but it's absolutely gorgeous, but it's got all kinds of things um, that, that indicate the procession of the equinoxes and archetypal energies, you know, gods and goddesses, the phases of the moon, uh, you know, the, the, our place in terms of the processional cycle. And it's it's really, um, it's, it's, it's remarkable and uh, challenging to interpret. But apparently we're, we're getting closer to understanding what the ancients were trying to say. So they had a 360-day calendar. They had three um, weeks of 10 days, and we have, you know, four weeks of seven days, and 
And this idea of 365 days is what happened. It cha- it knocked the orbit of the whole solar system off to the point where a year ended up being five days longer. So in Egypt, instead of changing the calendar, and we know that the Gregorian calendar was altered you know, relatively recently, um, they just had five days out of time. And they honored, you know, a god and goddess for each one. So Isis, Osiris, Set, Horus, and Neftis, I guess. Um, And so each day was a celebration of those gods and goddesses. And then the rest of the year was the 360 days as they knew it. So, you know, they, they were all about understanding these cycles of time. And so that is related to Atlantis. It's related to when the flood happened. And then people are trying to say, well, where was Atlantis? Well, it seems that it was a seafaring culture and that everywhere we think Atlantis was would have been part of it, that it would have been uh, global. And so the idea of Plato's, um, the the concentric circles and the pyramids was that the ships would come in because they had these huge trade routes and then they would turn right and go around and then stop and drop off their goods and be, the, the ships would be filled back up with other goods, and then they keep going in this similar direction and out in the harbor. So we see, you know, many constructions um, just outside the uh, the pillars of Hercules in the Strait of Gibraltar. Uh, it could have been in the Atlantic Ocean, the Azores. There's there's several places on the planet that seem to have these round cities, but that simply is a signature of Atlantis of how they would have built their cities all over the world, but if you're going to have that amount of, you know, impact on the planet, like a global catastrophe, then it changes the the level of the water everywhere, and a lot of these places just kind of sank. So we've got those wagon tracks in Malta, and they just end at the end of a cliff. Well, the rest of it's down underwater. So when we had that big tsunami in uh, December 26, several years ago, in India, you know, the water receded to the point you could see that there were cities down there. And so... Barbara Han Clow wrote about catastrophobia, that mm-hmm. we all have this kind of, you know, collective amnesia, and that these accidents happen, but we don't really know, we don't have a map of where to put it, um, and yet it's it's on the collective psyche of, of us as a humanity because of what happened. Carmen, you really have to have a, also a really good sense of uh, geology to uh, put some of these pieces together and uh, through history. And I think that's really remarkable. And the idea that the layout of Atlantis was through necessity of distributing goods and services by boat. And that model is repeated in other civilizations as well. Exactly. And the Chinese, you know, they had desalinization. They were growing sprouts and fruits and vegetables right on the boats. And they were able to go all over the planet. And then when they built the Great Wall, which I think is largely psychological, they they, they pulled all their ships home, their fleets, and they they lived without interfacing with the rest of the world. But again, Gavin Menzies is talking about how the Chinese could easily have come to North America long before Columbus and that they were seafaring. But where did they learn that? And so the idea is the third-party hypothesis that if the Chinese, the Egyptians, the Mayans, they're all talking about ancestors that taught them about civilization, it could be that they all had the same ancestors, which would have been the third party, which could have been the Atlanteans. But then who taught the Atlanteans? Who came before that? And what did they know? So we're really dealing with an awful lot of lost knowledge. And it's true that in order to be able to retrieve all this, it needs to be Mm cross-disciplinary. So I did start out in my first undergrad degree with geology as my minor and psychology as my major. So I've studied, you know, astrology at the graduate, sorry, um, archaeology at the graduate level and a lot of these different disciplines. But the whole thing about how to do academic research comes into play, how to support the ideas with references of ancient texts or whatever, so that you're not talking through your hat. And so we, we can't make it up. We have to somehow grounded in reality, but if we don't understand geological time and, and worldwide catastrophes, then you know, we don't have all the cards in the deck if, if we're doing that. And you know, to say everything started you know, with the flood and that nothing happened before it uh, is naive. It's very troubling in a lot of ways that that imprint is uh, really reinforced in this country and around the world on, on many different levels in South America as well, as you pointed out. Uh, because we don't get a sense of our 
collective history as human beings on this planet. But I can't wait to see what happens here. What's the next step for beginning to get these permits and move toward excavating? Well, there's there's a couple of groups that are competing to get there first and get the permits. Mm-hmm. And of course, it'll all be up to the Supreme Council of Antiquities. And I think it has to be, you know, as strong academically as possible. And and the teams that are, you know, formulating uh, aren't necessarily archaeologists. So it's a question of submitting the application with the blessing of the elite in Egypt. And that's what we have to work towards and, you know, share the scan and validate that the scan is actually something that, you know, can help. And then the permits are granted and then off you go. Um, so um, I I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if they're going to let us do it, which is why I think that, you know, speculating here, um, you know, is just giving us an idea that, that, that it's possible and weaving this story together. But it's, it's a little, what if we find stuff down there that's really different, right? Um, exactly. I mean, talk about a disclosure event. Mm-hmm. How do you put that into context? And my investment is filming because, you know, there's a chance that once the excavation happens, it could be buried, I mean, figuratively, and that the information doesn't come out. And I think that this is, you know, humanity's heritage. And so we owe it to ourselves to, you know, expand our capacity to look backwards in time and to think about what happened here, what happened in another time frame. I mean, the fact that this is hidden from humanity, that we don't know who we are or where we came from or why we're here and all of the stuff that goes with UFO disclosure and everything, it's its mind-boggling that we've been programmed to just look at such a narrow window of time. But what's the purpose of that? You know, so the whole thing, even with the Sitchin material, is that, you know, we were enslaved and star-seeded from, you know, other planets and, you know, we had to work to get the gold and we were enslaved. Well, the implication is that we're not enslaved now. And all of these different things fit together to keep us in a place of disempowerment and also giving our power to the priest or to whoever to, you know, take care of us or, you know, the government to take care of us, the priest to, you know, ensure our salvation when we pass. And that sort of thing is all about disempowerment. And so if we were to truly be an empowered humanity, well, what, does, what does that look like? So, you know, in matriarchal cultures, the idea was empowerment empowerment of everyone connect include and and that sort of thing and that we have we can touch our own divinity within ourselves without needing an external um you know religion to to give us that and so we are living in a very disempowering time that's why this is so important to think that possibly we 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 did have a whole different social structure And it was about honoring the planet and leaving more for the next generations and that sort of thing. This this coincides, and in the interviews I've done with you before, we talk about, you know, the 3113 BC, the beginning of the patriarchal era of Egypt, and then this narrow 5,000-year period of time, which is patriarchal. And I've been saying all along that the agenda of the patriarchy has been to erase evidence of everything other than itself. So burn the books. Put the people who have the high technology in jail, Willem Reich, Tesla, you know, drive everybody who knows stuff into obscurity, tell the new story, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. And then everybody goes, okay. And so all of the different, you know, public relations and consumerism and all those different things have just clouded clouded our vision without looking at the possibility that we were magnificently empowered in other times. This whole mechanism of dumbing us down and, you know, the propaganda that goes on in education and all of that, pharmaceuticals and, you know, keeping everybody uh, unhealthy has been the mechanism through which that we have not been able to figure out what we're doing here. Well said, Dr. Bolter, and thank you once again for bringing this information forward. And it's through exhaustive traveling, a lot of interference that you share the preliminary news of one of the most significant Egyptian archaeological site discoveries in our, in our lifetimes. For listeners wanting to contact Dr. Bolter or find out more information, please visit thepyramidcode.com. Dr. Bolter, thank you again for being on Another News. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. 
That's going to do it for In Other News. I'm Jeff Brady. Join me again on Dark Matter Radio. And also, please visit inothernewsradio.com.